very pleased this morning to be joined by John Rocker from Sydney City Toyota. Um, he is an automotive expert. John, very pleased to see you. Thanks, Janine. Thanks for having me. It's good to Fantastic. be here. Fantastic. Okay, I want to talk today principally about leaders in the automotive industry. Um, why don't we get started by you giving me your definition of what a great leader in the industry is? I think a great leader in general, I think, um, can be misconceived sometimes. I think leadership is... Um, a lot of people think it comes from a hard place. You've got to be a tough person to be a leader. I actually think it comes from the opposite. I think it comes from a, a place of uh, empathy, a place where people have a vision or can see something that others can't see and um, they want to achieve it, but they can't do it on their own. So they then sell that vision or that dream or inspire people to follow them to achieve that dream. And by doing that, you gather people who are willing to, I guess, accept it. So you're sort of selling the dream mm. uh, or the vision and then people um, will follow that person as the leader to get there because they are either interested in what they're doing or can see part of that vision themselves. Okay, fantastic. And I couldn't agree more on that. Um, you've had a fantastic life, an interesting life. Um, you're known as the nicest person in the industry that can sell a car or two. I know a few that might uh, think differently, but yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> that's not been my experience. How did you get started in the automotive industry? Talk me through it. Uh, always been a car perv, a bit of a car lover. As a kid, I used to sort of borrow uh, Wheels car magazines from libraries when I couldn't afford to buy them. So I've always been a car person. Wasn't sure where you were going with that when you brought up magazines. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, as a young person, it could have been any magazine, I guess, but... Yeah, it was Wheels magazines, and um, I used to borrow them from the library when I, when I couldn't afford to buy them. Always been a car person, um, rugby league player as a junior. Um, was uh, then scouted by the Canterbury Bulldogs as a junior. Went through the ranks there, and then they decided that um, I needed a job at some stage. So before that, I did a little bit of an apprenticeship with my father, who was a jeweller. Uh, didn't like that at all. I was just sort of sitting in the one place for too long. So long story short, the Sutton's group were one of the club sponsors and I said, yeah, look, I'd love to sell some cars and off I went. Fantastic. Yeah. So where did it go from there? Uh, trainee salesperson to salesperson, obviously. And then I sort of worked my way through the ranks. I didn't stay in um, uh, too many places for longer than sort of three years. I felt that after three years, I was told once in the first year in the car business, if you can survive it, you're doing well. Three years, you'll probably know as much as you'll know about that particular dealership. And as I saw other people progress through uh, the industry, I thought three to three and a half years is probably a good time. And at the two and a half year mark, I was getting itchy anyway as a, as a young person. So I've learned later in life that you've got to be a bit more patient than that. But uh, it, it didn't do me uh, too bad. I sort of jumped in the deep end in a few jobs that I thought I might have been um, underqualified for, but uh, I sort of jumped in the deep end and, and swam. Yeah, fantastic. So what, what advice would you give to a, a trainee salesperson today getting into the industry, given that in some respects um, in sales it hasn't changed a lot and in other no. respects it's changed a hell of a lot in terms of what... Oh, particularly, you know, yeah, absolutely. Well, okay, our, our industry has, has gone from, you know, being the, um, the car salesperson to what I would perceive as being probably the best in any industry when it comes to customer service and how much focus is placed on it. But we just, we've got that stigma, that bad name, but we're very good at customer service. So what I would say to a young person starting off is you've got to be very patient, which I wasn't in the beginning. So if I had to talk to myself as an 18 year old, which is when I started, uh, it would be that. Uh, so patience is one. Um, and if you don't like the industry, don't stay in it. It's yeah. one of those industries, it's like a lot of um, retail types of industries. Yeah. Um, if you're not a people person or if there are elements about working six or seven days a yeah. week, which is what's required a lot yeah. of the times, let's be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Weekend work, and particularly in New South Wales, you know, it's uh, seven days a week. Yeah. So yeah. very different for the Gen Ys that are out there today. They don't like the weekends. <laughs> well, they love, they love the weekends. They just don't like working them, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's exactly. interesting. We've had to modify our business for that as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so what compelled you to buy into Sydney City Toyota, leave the corporate career behind, given that you had actually been a CEO of Lexus at one point, changing from corporate into mm. being a, a business owner yourself, what was the sort of big reason behind that? Uh, never saw myself as a corporate person to begin with, so um, always aspired to own my own businesses, mm -hmm. but was given a fantastic opportunity through Lexus to become the, uh, the CEO, which I was for nine years, loved it. 
it became a real education for me. That was my uni degree, so nine years of running a fantastic brand um, that was in trouble to begin with. So my first brief with Lexus was it's um, it, it's going to finish in November. It was April when I started, and they said we we've got to fix this very very quickly or we're out of Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the good news was I was given autonomy to do anything that I wanted to do with that brand because they were where they were and I had no corporate experience so it was a good opportunity for me to sort of um, I guess implement what I thought would be good from a retail point of view given that the dealer network for Lexus was the issue so they weren't making money and I know that a dealer that doesn't make money is not a happy dealer yeah. so I focused on getting the dealer network right and sort of work my way backwards as I learnt the corporate world I then influenced the corporate side of it but I started with the retail side of it first. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I um, I was, I got into a bit of trouble myself recently for talking about the recession and the, the challenging times that we're in, particularly here in Australia. Mm. Um, I got in trouble for using the word recession. Uh, they preferred a much more softer term. <laughs> um, but as business owners, and that's fundamentally what every DP is, they're a business Absolutely, owner. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's really important that they understand um, the situation they're currently in so that mm. they can put steps into place um, to, to trade out of it in essence. Because the, the interesting thing that I found as being a non-automotive um, specialist is that the industry itself is not set up to make a lot of money out Absolutely, of actually Absolutely, yeah. So you've oh, got to get it right. It's a volume business. Yes. Yeah. And it's a very diverse business. People think the car dealers are car dealers. We're, mm. we're parts. I mean, we, we turn over millions of dollars in spare parts, mm. um, more so than we do in cars. Yep. Um, we're a customer service business. We're a service business. We're a finance business. So, and then we add cars onto the end of that, sort of the beginning of the cycle. But yeah, look, my, um, back, getting back to the original question, I think uh, my corporate um, experience was fantastic, but I always wanted to own my own business. I saw, I saw people who were in high positions or owners of dealerships, and as my confidence grew, my experience grew, I looked at these people and I thought, one, I can do it, and I, I thought I had a few ideas of how I could do it better. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and given that you are actually in the top 20 consistently, mm. um, that's obviously born to be true. It's, yes, it's something yeah. that you, you're in one of the toughest markets in automotive. There's plenty mm. of competitors out there. Um, what are some of the tips and tricks that you sort of put into place in your dealership without giving away the secrets, sure. steps, obviously? Yeah. <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> not all of them. But what are some of the things that you've done? Oh, I think people, people, people. I yep. think that's, that's what I've done. Um, I, when I first started, I gave the people who were there, I was advised that there were a lot of people that probably should go as part of the takeover or the, the, the purchase of the business. We chose not to do that because I didn't know, um, when I asked them the question of who, I, it was owned by Toyota Motor Corporation, when I asked the question of who I should get rid of, they couldn't name enough people in the business, so I thought I'd better not be advised. I'll just sort of uh, suck and see for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, through progression, I just realised that there were some people who were in the wrong places. We, we haven't really gone backwards in terms of headcount, but we've had a major reshuffle, which you've been part of. And, um, you know, without your assistance, I think a lot of things probably wouldn't have come to fruition mm -hmm. as quickly as they did. So mm -hmm. that was a major help for me um, personally and for my business and my managers as well. So once we got on the right track, we felt that we had to make some tough decisions. Uh, again, something you've taught me. Um, which I think eventually a lot of people get there, but I think what you add to that is when, like if you're going to do it, if, if you know you need to do it, let's do it now, well, what are we waiting for? So I took a lot of, uh, out of that in the last 12 months. I've made some major changes in management. I've sort of um, thinned the line, I guess, um, and it's worked out to be really, really good. And I think the reason why it's worked well is because it, I took my time fighting who the right people were you never quite know 100%, but um, yeah, getting it done quick, quickly and with the right people, that's what I think drives a really good business. And we're, we're almost there now. I can, I can actually feel the difference within my business. I can see it in my staff. I can see it in my management team. So That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I spent Friday working with the business owner and talking about that very thing, about mm. making the hard decisions but making them early on. Yes. Um, and the change that comes about in the culture, once there is a high-performance culture, there's an expectation that everyone 
who is there has to perform. Absolutely. The change amongst those people is amazing. I think as a leader in the business, when mm. you start to see them change and you start, yes. start to see them grow and respond yeah, under absolutely. those new conditions, absolutely. that's when making those hard decisions yeah. becomes worth it. Yeah. And I think as a leader as well, I think we sort of you know tend to sort of say a lot of things, but uh, we don't actually do what we say sometimes. We're telling a lot of people, so as you know, one of my focuses in business is courage and speed. Mm. And I think the courage part, I think, lacked there for me for a, for a certain period of time. And then when I finally woke up to it, then speed came into play. So those two together for me are, are priceless. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's a tough, it's a tough gig um, running your own business. But I want to ask this, what's the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in your leadership journey? I think it's it's the people part for me. I think it's um, because you, you sort of, I'm an optimist. So I see the good in everybody to begin with, right? So. Uh, that sort of helps me a lot and it hinders me and I've learned over uh, recent times that you know what you see is what you get and sometimes you can influence as much as you think you can but you know when it's a duck if it walks like a duck it talks like a duck it is a duck so I've learned that very very quickly recently um, yeah look to me it's just giving people an opportunity I see people I've seen people in dark places in my own business that I thought Geez, that person's pretty good. Why he? Why is he or she sitting in that position when I think they could be, you know, in a better position? I mentioned earlier jumping in the deep end, so I've taken people and thrown them in the deep end, yep. uh, and found that some of these people with the right character, the right attitude, maybe not the right skills, you can teach that. Yep. Uh, throw them in the deep end, and then they've swum really well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Mm. And I, I can remember being taught by my very first boss was a great gentleman that owned a cafe, and he said to me. Janine, at the end of the day, as long as they've got the right attitude, they've got the right work ethic, yes. I can teach them anything. Absolutely, but if I don't agree. have the right attitude and the right work ethic, you're on a flogging yeah. to nothing. Agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. There were just, some people are just in the wrong lane, not given the opportunity. So yeah. you sort of give them that opportunity, you'd be surprised by what they can do. Yeah, mm. I agree 100%. Um, your company is consistently in the top 20 of all automotive businesses in the country. Your leadership in no small part is the reason. Mm. Um, why do, do you think that there is actually such a thing as a born leader? Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything uh, or such a thing as a born leader. Uh, I've thought about this question because I've been asked a couple of times. I don't think I was a born leader. I think um, the empathy part for me is what creates a leader. Mm. I think, the, and what I mean by that is somebody sees an opportunity or a problem or an issue and rather than sitting back and letting it happen or watching the train uh, crash about to happen, I think at some point something inside that individual says, oh, I want to try and help uh, this situation and I'm going to you know, stick my neck out and see what happens. I think that's the beginning of leadership and I think others sort of see that in you and think, geez, that was, that was a courageous move or a stupid move is one or the other. Yeah. And you don't know at the time, but no, I don't think I don't. Leaders are born. I think leaders are are people that 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 uh, uh, develop from a certain situation, and people who I don't know what it is within them that says I'd like to do something about this rather than sit back and watch. Mm -hmm. And I think that inspires people, and then that then creates that leadership piece where people look at you and think, "Wow, you know, I I, I had exactly the same thought, but I didn't act like he did or she did." And to me, that's a leader. Mm, that's amazing. I couldn't agree more with that whole piece there. I think that um, not sort of, you know, repeat everything you just said, but I think if, if it does come from a place of empathy, people mm. pick up on that. Yeah. And then if that translates into action, Absolutely. people get behind that. But you're right, not everyone has that sort of critical middle piece of the courage to act. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So many people sit there and go, I know I should have, I know I should have, but they're waiting for that's someone. That's it. To create that momentum. That's it. And, and that's that's not an ability. I don't think you're born with that. I think we all see it. Yeah. Uh, those who choose to act. So, you know, it, to me, anybody can become uh, an inspiring leader because I think we're all seeing that situation. We're all looking at it thinking, something needs to be done about this. I'll just wait for somebody else. Yeah. That's the follower. The leader will actually get up and do something about it. And look, you, you know, you fail many times in doing it, but if I had to advise anybody who was young saying, oh, look, I aspire to be a leader, I'd say just use that courage piece um, and speak up, have a go, yep. fall, learn from the lesson, get up again. Yeah, fantastic. All right, um, how do you build an A-grade team? Um, you pay them well. <laughs> People say that money's not important. I don't believe that. I think money is the, one of the major reasons we get out of bed in the morning because it gives us a lot of things in life. 
Uh, I'm not driven entirely by money, but I think it's a very important piece of it. Uh, and so I like to remunerate people well, but I also like to coach them inside and outside the business. Yep. So for me, what is happening outside on a daily basis influences what's happening inside and vice versa. Yeah, I don't, I don't need to have dinner with them. I don't need to uh, you know, know their entire uh, life story. But to me, getting to know these guys in and out, I think influences the play either at work or at home. And, and I'm very conscious of what happens at work to what the reaction is at home as well. So it's not just, a lot of people say, look, you bring your problems to work. Most of the time we're taking our problems from work home. So, you know, to try and create something where there's a, we have our good days and our bad days, but in, the, in general, um, I just like to um, make things a little bit simple. Mm -hmm. I like to dumb things down and uh, I like to have a little bit of fun as well. Mm -hmm. A good laugh at work creates a good team, I think. Yep. Yeah, just to take the pressure off. In the automotive industry, and this is not a normal question that I would ask you, John, but mm. um, I've known you for some time now. I've met your lovely wife and your children. Um, you've got a very, very successful marriage, mm. and that's unusual in this industry. It is, in yeah, yeah. Any tips on that? Oh, God, tips on marriage. Um, <laughs> luck. <laughs> laughter. Good selection. Laughter, <laughs> laughter. Just a good sense of humour and not taking things too seriously. Yep. Um, there have been times where, you know, I've been away from Veronique a lot. Um, she's been super supportive. So, you know, they, sort of, they talk about the woman behind the man or the man behind the woman. We've known each other for a long time and we don't take things too seriously. We realise that it's not going to be easy going all the time. But by realising that it's not going to be or admitting that it's not going to be, I've got to tell you it has been. So maybe it is luck, I don't know. But, um, you know, we, um, we get along very well, and I think that, that helps. We've got a very strong bond, as you know, with the boys as well, my two sons, Jacob and Jackson, and we're pretty close-knit. We like to holiday together and spend time together, and I think it's just that support piece where she knows her place. Veronique knows that she's got to do a lot for me. Um, I call her the chairman, mm -hmm. uh, and she knows she is, yeah. and that's, it. <laughs> that's sure how it does. works. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, plenty. Um, uh, I failed, uh, and look, it's funny, I failed at the beginning and I'm still failing today, but um, I, actually, I actually like failure. And I, the reason why I like it is because I think it, in, it keeps me awake, mm -hmm. it keeps me aware of what, uh, you know, what failures could be. And I don't fail because I do the same thing every day, I fail because I try different things. Mm -hmm. So without failure for me, um, I'd probably give it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I can win unless I lose. One of my biggest lessons I learned in rugby league, I, was, I played a game, um, it was a long, long time ago, but I, I broke my nose and collarbone in that game. And, and I remember being under the, the post um, as captain of that team, looking at some blokes in the eye saying that, who were much better footballers than me, and telling them that we weren't going to walk it back, we were going to run it back to the halfway line to kick off after the other team had scored. Uh, and we lost 54 to four that day. And that was my greatest lesson that, you know, you just pick yourself up, you just go again, you run it back to halfway. We ran it back to halfway a lot of times that night. Yeah. Um, but that was a good lesson for me. So I think failure is, is trying. Mm. Uh, if you don't fail, I don't think you're trying. Yeah, yeah. I was speaking to a client's wife last week and she was talking to me. They're, they're at the stage where they're about to appoint um, a general manager and that's right. a contentious issue for her and her husband. But she was saying <laughs> to me that, um, you know, she wants to get a general manager in so she can alleviate some of the problems. And I had to pull her back and say, look, one of the things about being in business is you're actually solving problems mm. for other people. Yes. That's what you're doing fundamentally. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I know about appointing a general manager in a business it's not about taking your problems away. It's quite the opposite. It's about putting some structure in place to be able to expand, to be able to grow. Absolutely, but yeah. The problems don't disappear. No, not at all. And if you think that you're in business for problems to be, you know, solved by somebody else, yeah, you're probably in the wrong headspace anyway to be a business. Couldn't owner. agree more. I think if you've got a good general manager, you're just going to get more problems. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly, yeah. To, to that point, I think I think you're right. I agree. Yeah. Because I, I don't. Yeah. I think. Problems are, are a natural part of being in business, and I think yeah. you have to ha adopt the mindset of you know constantly solving other people's problems. I know sitting in your office quite a few times, the amount of times 
a scenario would happen with you know mm. a guest where you would have to be you know going and dealing with that yeah, guest and talking absolutely. them through you know their issues or their challenges mm. and you know the resolution of that you know happy guest at the end of it was the, the yeah, end goal absolutely but let's be honest that's not always something that a salesperson or a sales trainee has got the skill to do yeah that's right and I think that's where you know management comes into into that play but you know we talk about problems we talk about general managers um, I, I I'd like to refer them to them as challenges as opposed to problems. You're always gonna get them. Mm. And frankly, um, with a good general manager um, that creates more challenges, I think inspires you as a leader as well. And I, but yeah, if, if somebody thinks I'm gonna put a general manager in to do my job, they've got another thing coming. They're just gonna create more problems or more challenges and with that, more success. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a week. I like to say to my guys, let's look for problems before they arise so we're on this uh, little bit of a, a mission at the moment i'm saying let's disrupt our business before somebody else does yep. where where are the challenges where are the weaknesses and we've got some and we've identified them and i think we're better off disrupting them themselves ourselves rather than somebody else so i'm saying you know self-disrupt or self-destruct yep. is what i'm saying and i think a general manager would, would do that for your business yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay, um, what's the most common reason for people failing or giving up? Patience. Yeah, confidence, lack of. Mm -hmm. um, and with that lack of confidence, I, find, I found over the, the years that um, that lack of confidence comes from lack of support or maybe lack of inspiration or, yeah, I, I just think that any game, whether it be business, sport, um, is a confidence game. So... I think the issue is that if you, if, you, if you can't give that person that confidence, they're not going to succeed. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's, I think, confidence when you're a business owner in particular. Mm. There's not a lot of people coming to you and telling yeah. you how fantastic you are. Yeah. It's, it's quite the opposite. They're coming to you with all their challenges. They're coming to you and saying to you, you know, JR, can you fix this for me, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Who gives you confidence? Uh, my own people, mm -hmm. yeah. I look at my guys and uh, and and girls and think, wow, you know, if she if she didn't do what she did uh, in that particular situation, um, then my business would have been affected. And you know, they surprise me every day of the week, good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know they're having a go, and I get inspiration from my own staff. I look at people that think, you know, we just had a massive um, result in our service business uh, from one of the changes that you and I have discussed over the time. And that inspires me because I know where that part of that business was. I know the individuals and the conversations that we've had with the individuals involved. And to see that flourish as much as it has, that surprises me, that inspires me. Um, you know, customers inspire me. Other business people inspire me. Um, you inspire me. So there's, there's a lot. I think it comes from a lot of places. Yeah, mm. good. I think it's important, though, and I, that, that's the point that I would make, is if you don't have someone who is actually pushing you yeah. or getting you to look at yourself yes. in different ways, you yeah. need to go and find that. Absolutely. It's a very yeah. lonely place at the top is the one. It is, yeah. yeah. Well, who, motivates, who motivates the motivator? I, I think from my perspective, I guess just keep yourself in my position. I'll challenge myself. I don't like to lose, yeah. so that sort of helps. But, yeah. um, you know, you, you lose, you learn, you move on. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. All right. Um, what do you wish you had known when you started out? Oh, I wish I hadn't known it was as hard as it is because it's never easy. Uh, there's no silver bullet. That's what I've learned. You know, I've learned that you know if you get what you what you work for. A mm -hmm. uh, little bit of luck comes along the way. I also think you create your own luck. It's amazing how lucky you get when you work hard uh, and when you show up. Uh, so to me, I think, yeah, I, I've made some mistakes along the way, but I think what I've learned mo most of all is that nothing comes easy. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I'm sort of comfortable with that. It's just that trigger where you, you get to a point you say, I understand now that nobody's going to give me this, so I have to take it. That's part of that jumping in that deep end. Yeah, mm. couldn't agree more. Um, who do you look up to in business and why? Ooh. Um, I, I, do, I do get inspired by people who are in my industry who have been around for a long time that know their, their craft, although it's changed so much because I'm, I'm speaking of the older generation in my, in my industry. But I, I get inspired by other industries as well. I, I like success stories, but I also like the background of where they've come from. I, I like, you know, 
if you're handed the business and you know your job is to maintain it, that's not as easy as it seems sometimes. But I'm really inspired by people that have come from nowhere, uh, who have made a really good um, you know job of it or a successful part of it. I get inspired from a lot of places. I get inspired by music. I get inspired by um, other industries. Uh, yeah, my inspiration comes from a lot of places. Yeah. Tell me about one in particular, one person that, that um, you know, motivates you. Yeah, uh, that motivates me. Yeah. Uh, that would be Veronique, motivates me a lot. Um, and I think uh, I've got a general manager that I've just um, uh, employed uh, who I've known for a very long time. We sort of parted ways. He went into another industry and recently wanted to come back into the car industry. And he's given me a fresh uh, lease on life just recently. So that's, that's today. But um, my hardest critics in terms of people that I work for, there are two individuals that, uh, that I work for, one and, and two completely different individuals, which is probably why they've inspired me. But they, uh, one in particular, who was Michael O'Brien, who was uh, my first uh, boss when I joined Lexus, when Lexus was an unknown brand, we had one car. He, he was very tough. Um, and I was warned that he was very tough. And the two individuals that have inspired me the most have been the toughest. Uh, and I was told by just about everybody in, in the industry that I should not work for these two individuals. And the fact that I did um, probably made me who I am today in the industry, which is quite interesting. A lot of people couldn't, and, and that's where I was taught the patience game by that particular person being Michael. He drew me a, a, a map once on a piece of paper and he said, uh, mate, I've been watching you, you work hard, but you zigzag everywhere. He said, mate, if, you, if that was a piece of string and you pulled it out, you've gone so far over the top, you don't need to go that far. Just go the straight line, stop the zigzagging. You're gonna get there a lot quicker with a lot less aggro. And all that taught me was patience. That's what was missing for me. Because I thought, you know, two and a half, three years, what's next? Um, and I actually did end up leaving him um, because I, I was offered another opportunity. But what I learned from him, I took on from that point on. Uh, my first year in corporate was a very tough uh, year and I thought I can always go back to retail and, and fall back on that. And I think I might after the first year and had a couple of chats with him and he said, mate, just remember that piece of string and that lasted nine years. And, you know, CEOs of, of car companies don't last that long in that position. So that was really good for me. And I've taken that with me and I preach that every day. Mm. Patience. Fantastic. All right. Where to next for John Rocker and Sydney City Toyota? So we're not number one in the country. We're not far off it, but we will be. So that's next for us. I think I've now got the right formula in terms of people to achieve that. Um, the market, as you know, at the moment is soft and we're, we're defying the odds in a big way. Yeah. So while the market's back um, roughly 10% in volume and about 30% in luxury, uh, we're up 30% across the board, which is really good. So that's, that's helping. And I like fighting uphill. So, and that's what I teach my guys, that you know, stop reading the newspapers because they're not gonna buy any cars. I haven't met a rich journalist yet. So <laughs> let's not worry about that. And uh, let's just look after the customer that walks in the door. So what's next for me is probably growth, maybe a little bit more. We're about to open up another Lexus dealership in our PMA at Glebe that uh, you would be aware of. So that'll happen next year. We're, um, we'll look at other, um, uh, other businesses as well, other uh, car dealerships. Whether I wanna to get too big in the car business or divert to something, something different, uh, that's on the, my, on the back of my mind. You and I have spoken about that. Don't quite know what that is yet, but um, whatever it is, I know it's going to be something that I'm interested in. It's not going to be a business that I'll look at and say there's an opportunity to sell more hamburgers at this hamburger joint. If I'm not uh, interested in hamburgers, it might be that. Yeah. But yeah, um, real estate comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there's a part of me that believes that uh, I could have been a very good real estate agent <laughs> at some <laughs> stage, or maybe some sort of you know real estate empire. But I haven't ruled that out. So. Oh, very nice. <laughs> yeah, here we go again. So yeah, something like that. But whatever it is, it'll be uh, something out of interest. And I'm getting to a situation now where I, I still don't have my business where it wants to be. The minute that I see that it's close, I'm always looking. Yeah. But uh, in terms of pulling the trigger and, and actually doing and jumping in the deep end again, mm. that's not too far away, I think. Mm. 
Okay, so one of the things that I talk to business owners, including yourself, mm. about all the time is succession planning. Yes. It's so very, very important to have depth in your business, in yes. particular if you do want to grow. Um, I've met your son, Jacob. Yes. An amazing man, an amazing young man. Um, I feel old saying that, but an amazing, <laughs> yeah. an amazing young man. Um, he's obviously part of your succession planning. Mm. Having your son in the business can always be a tough thing. I have got my children in my business. Yes, absolutely. And I always tell them the standard of excellence is yeah. the standard you need to set. Otherwise, yeah. I'll be right behind you pushing you. Yeah. Um, what do you see ahead for Jacob in the industry in the years to come? A lot of change. Uh, I think it'll be a very different industry for, for Jake, but the good thing about it is he's probably coming at the right time because we're changing and we're changing fast. So he's, uh, he's in the thick of that. He's been through various parts of the business. So as you know, I've started him uh, nowhere near the top. In fact, where I started Jake, he couldn't see the top from there. So he keeps reminding me of that every now and then, and I'm sure he's reminded you as well. Once or twice. But uh, he's, he's um, without any creation on my part, he is a mini me yep. uh, in, in a lot of ways. He's not as patient as I am, but I wasn't at his age either. So there, there's that story. Um, he can, he suffers fools a lot less than I do as well. So he's get, he gets that from his mum. I, I don't think that's a bad trait. That's something that I've sort of learned along the way. They're still better than me at it. He, he will be um, right at the forefront of change. He's seeing it today from a marketing point of view, service, sales, every part. I think he, the business that he owns eventually, which I will pass on to him, um, will be something that he'll know very well. He'll know the characters, he'll know the, the formulas, he'll know the customer, uh, and he'll know every single role in that dealership uh, and those to come. We're, we're, you know, we're gonna move into mobility solutions you know, car dealerships will be where you rent your car, where you swap your car, not necessarily buy your car. Mm -hmm. So that's all changing. So I think Jake is uh, poised for some big change. And I think it's a very exciting time for him to be in the business, but he's working hard at it. But as you know, it's not easy being the dealer principal's son or the owner's son or no. daughter. Uh, so they've got to do it the hard way. I think they, in a way they do it a lot harder than we do. And I've seen so many dealer principal owners, sons and daughters fail mainly sons, the daughters seem to do better. The sons tend to fail because they're given too much too early. So, and you know, I've probably gone too far the other way uh, at times with Jake, but um, yeah, he's, he's very good at what he does and he'll only get better over time. And I see him taking over uh, long-term, yep. yeah. How long do you reckon? Uh, Until I, he gets to nudge you out of that <laughs> office and chair. I, I would say within, within the 10 years, but closer to the 10, I would say. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm like. I'm not going to go e easy. <laughs> depends on what my other interest is. So it depends on what that is. It might be earlier for Jake. You might want me out of there earlier. We don't actually interact very much in business because I've sort of kept him sort of to the fixed operations, which is parts and service. Uh, he's in marketing at the moment, so I keep telling him he's in the champagne division at the moment. It's not going to last for very long. <laughs> he'll go into accounts and finance shortly, so he'll love that from marketing. <laughs> And then I'll bring him into the, um, the front end of the business that we call the front end being sales and finance, as in selling finance and, and selling cars and then management and so forth. And that's where my strengths lie. So I think we'll play a bigger part in that part. Um, but I, I try and keep the business separate um, when we're at home. So at home, he's Jake, my son. Yeah. Uh, we very rarely speak about work. Um, but I've got to tell you, and you probably experienced this as well, some of the insights that he has on people has actually taught me uh, a lot about my own people. Either get involved in that because this person needs more of your time to, you know, uh, I don't see what you see in that person. And it, it influences me to a degree that makes me wake up and watch yeah. and then sit back and then my experience will then take over and say he's either right or he's either wrong. But yeah, he sort of, few light bulb moments, which is great because it shows me that he's interested in not so much just the business side of it, but the people within it as well. A hundred percent. He's got probably one of the sharpest minds I've seen, mm. bar none. 
Um, he's a lot like my daughter in that respect. He's got yeah, a line absolutely. beyond his years. Couldn't agree more. Um, and I think he will he will be pushing you out of that chair as opposed <laughs> to you as opposed to you gracefully. You know, he'll be like, okay, you're done. Get yeah, out of my yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, you're still you're yeah, yeah. You're still here. You're still here. Yeah. No longer required. Get over to your other business. Yeah, and, possibly. Uh, yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, he's definitely got that in him. Um, all right, fantastic. Well, John, any other sort of closing comments from you about the industry, about leadership that you'd like to leave us with today? No, just the, yeah, just one thing, and that is what I'm talking to my team about now is, you know, self-disrupt. Have a look at where your weaknesses are because the way industries are moving, regardless of which one that you're in, um, people are looking at what you do and how you do it. Mm. Uh, and there are a lot of um, people that are thinking of doing it a different way and a much better way. So what is that in, in any business? Mm. Whether you're making sausages or building cars or homes, who is trying to disrupt you? Where are your weaknesses? Where are your gaps? Lower the water line. Have a look where the branches and the twigs are, but do it for yourself before somebody else does it for you, which could end your business completely. So exciting times, but if you're not with that change, that movement, you need to get on board. Yeah, if you're not on, you're not in. Exactly, spot on. Fantastic, thanks so much. Pleasure, good to see you. You too.